So today is July 27th, 2023. It's about 1.30 p.m. Um, this is Kelly Zakovic representing the City of Savannah Municipal Archives. I'm interviewing Molly for the Savannah LGBTQ plus oral history project. Uh, we're conducting this interview in City Hall. So thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so can you start by telling us your name? Mm -hmm. My name is Molly. All right, and when and where are, were you born? I was born in Washington, D.C. in 1998. And um, how long ago did you come to Savannah and why? I've been in Savannah for six months. I moved here with my partner, my fiance, um, who is in the military, and he was stationed here about six months ago. Um, and can you tell us your pronouns and how you identify? Yes, my pronouns are she, her, and I identify as a bisexual woman. Okay. Um, so would you like to share your sort of coming out journey with us today? Yeah, definitely. Um, it's a bit of a long one, so get ready. <laughs> um, I, so when I was young, I wasn't queer. I didn't know I was queer or I wasn't queer. I think I've heard a lot of stories about queer people you know, always knowing that something was different about them and then like reading the word lesbian in the dictionary or something like that and having this having this moment. Um, that was never true for me. And even since coming back, since coming out, I've looked back and tried to see, you know, were there signs that I repressed in childhood? Um, and I honestly don't think there were. I think, you know, no one ever asked me if I was queer and just assumed I was straight. So I just was, so I just never thought about it. Um, and while I was in college, um, my sophomore year of college, um, the very end of my sophomore year, which would have been 2018, and I had a very good friend, and one day I had absolutely, I never thought about anything before, I never thought that I was queer, I'd never been attracted to a woman, and we were at this party and something just happened and we kind of went off together and I had no idea what was going on. I was very surprised. I surprised myself a lot. Um, and I really, yeah, I, I had, I was just very shocked <laughs> and went home after the party and I was just lying in my bed like, what the heck <laughs> just happened? <laughs> And I didn't tell anyone for a while. Um, my friend and I kind of decided to keep things, keep things a little quiet. And I was like, perfect. I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> so I just thought about it all the time. And probably for about a year, um, I really just kept to myself. I wasn't sure what was going on. At the beginning, I was like, oh, okay, that was... That was weird, but it probably didn't mean anything. And then the more I started to think about it, I was wondering, you know, is it, do I just have these feelings for this one person? Or is this maybe something with other women or something that I should explore? Um, and yeah, so I, I thought about it all the time, like from the second I woke up until the second I went to bed. Um, none of my close friends were queer except for this one friend. So I didn't really feel like I knew really the words. Um, I knew everyone in my life would be super supportive, but I just wasn't sure what was going on. And so I just thought about it and thought about it and thought about it all day, every day, <laughs> and just kind of tried to find out who I was and if there was anything there. Um, so after about a year, I was, my friend and I both were studying abroad in different countries. And we both had friends, you know, abroad in different places. And so, we would meet up as a group of friends and in like three different European cities in Paris, Amsterdam, and Berlin, we'd like meet up and sneak off and no one knew what was going on. So it's this very beautiful, fun, kind of covert affair. And no one in my life suspected literally a thing um, because it just like, they wouldn't have thought that I would, that I would do that. And eventually, um, it was when we were in Berlin at Oktoberfest, we were all drinking a bunch of beers and my friend who is queer, he kind of like looked at me across the table and then looked at her and then looked back at me and it was kind of like, it was a very expressive conversation only through I, you know, only through just glances. He was kind of like, what's going on? I was just like, 
so he he figured me out and he um he, i ended up talking to him about it a lot and learned a lot about his experience and just kind of creating what my experience would look like and eventually so after studying abroad i went back to school and i started to tell people i told my best friend i slowly started to tell my other friends i told my sister i told my mom and everyone was very very supportive i'm incredibly incredibly lucky um everyone was very very surprised um no one was expecting it so it's just kind of like what like and they had a lot of questions that i didn't have answers for yet so you know like what are the labels or <laughs> what is you know like what what does this mean like what's going on and i just didn't really have any answers <laughs> um but I thought about it more and more and eventually I started to kind of come into more of a sense of identity at the beginning again I was like oh I'm not queer at all I'm not gay I couldn't even really say the word queer or think about the word lesbian maybe freak out I was like oh no 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 that's not me that's not me I just like maybe like sometimes like feel certain things and then I started to be like, you know, after a couple months, I was like, okay, I think maybe I'm like kind of gay, but like not that much and like not even bisexual, like none of that stuff. Um, and then it kept progressing and progressing. And every time my friends would check in, I'd be like, yeah, I actually think it's higher than last time. I kept trying to like put a percentage on it, which, you know, isn't really possible, but I kept trying. And eventually I started to notice like, I would notice women on the street more than I would notice men. I was like, oh, I think we're actually past the 50% mark. <laughs> and so then I was kind of, you know, still kind of struggling with labels, but starting to feel like I felt very gay and kind of figuring out what that meant. Eventually I settled in on the label of bisexual. It feels really good for me. And the way that I define it, I know there's a lot of different definitions out there, but the way that I define it is being attracted to people who have the same gender or other genders as me. So not on a like man, woman binary, um, but that gender is an important factor in my attraction to people. So that was kind of my long winded journey. Um, since kind of the end of college, I have been really, really proud of my identity and found a, a real home in the queer community, um, which has been particularly lovely. Okay. Um, so how would you say that your sort of relationships with cis men might have impacted your journey at all? Yeah, definitely. So I, um, other part of the story that wasn't in the initial telling is so I met the love of my life in kindergarten. We um, grew up in the same town, went to the same school since kindergarten, and we started dating in junior year of high school. So that would have been 2015. And you know, he said, I love you, and went to prom together. It was lovely. And this was way before I had even an inkling in my brain about being queer. And he is a cis man, so it was a straight relationship. And um, what, so we decided to do long distance. I was going to school in California, he's going to school in New York, he's joining the military. So it was, um, we did long distance, we decided to stay together. So we were together um, freshman and sophomore year of college and then eventually decided to kind of explore some alternate forms of relationships. We had both been only with each other and felt like maybe if we were gonna, make it work in the long run, we should see what else was out there. So we kind of took some breaks and, you know, did like hall passes, different types of relationships. And it was like in one of those times that I had this interesting encounter with my friend. And um, he, at the time, he was very supportive. He was like, okay, well, that's cool. Um, and then it was at the beginning of our senior year. So the beginning of like kind of winter, fall, winter of 2019 that I was kind of like, you know what? I actually think this might be a bigger part of who I am than I initially thought. And I actually think I might need to explore this apart from our relationship. And that was a really hard thing for me to do. 
Um, so we broke up and were broken up for our senior years of college and I got to explore myself in a very different way. It was absolutely lovely. I had incredible experiences with a lot of different people. And then in March of 2020, uh, COVID happened. And so we were all, we all left school and me and my now fiance both went back home to where we grew up um, in DC and kind of reconnected. I was like, listen, I think I'm at this point, probably 80, 90% gay, <laughs> but I think the rest is you. And I still really love you. And I really want to be together if you want. And it took a little while of just like thinking through that and for him to kind of come, you know, just, you know, make sense of all of that. But we got back together. Um, he's been very, very supportive of my sexuality and my journey. And it's been very, very lovely. Um, and we've been together since then and just got engaged like two weeks ago. So um, thank you, thank you. Um, but yeah, I do think that my, I mean, my whole adult life has been in the context of this relationship with this person that I love even when we weren't together. And it's been really interesting to kind of figure out who I am and what my sexual identity is both in the context of him and separate from him. Um, and I know a lot of other queer people, women especially, who have kind of gone through similar things. Um, and I think, you know, in some ways it's really lovely to have this anchor of love um, and, you know, makes me feel more confident and that I can figure out who I am, but it can also be really hard, especially when, you know, I am a really straight passing person and I am in a relationship with a man. So, you know, going through the world, no one is going to perceive me as queer, which is a privilege and affords me a lot of safety that a lot of people in the community don't have. But it can also be really challenging to kind of figure out what my place is in the community and, you know, do I have to keep coming out to every person I meet because, you know, they see me walking with my partner is someone who I'm not. Um, so it's just a lot of questions and kind of spirals that I can really get myself into. Um, but I'm really lucky to have a, a support system and a lot of people in my life that can kind of bring me back out, which is, which is great. That is a really lucky place to be. Yeah. Um, anything else that you want to sort of share about your relationship dynamics or this discovery or um that's a good question um one thing i would just say is that i think i'm just so grateful to have a partner who's willing to be really creative i think that creativity in relationships it's maybe not a word that comes right to mind but i think it's really crucial especially in the world that we live in now and especially if, you know, for people in the queer community um, or people who are figuring out who they are. And I think that being able to, you know, really assess each person's needs and desires and being able to say, all right, let's, how can we get creative about this? What are ways that we can think about to make this work? Even if they're maybe a little bit outside of the box or other people would think they were weird um, in different communities and I'm just really grateful to have found someone that's willing to embark on that creativity with me. Do you want to share an example of that creativity or is that a little personal? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's a great question. Um, well, I think creativity in terms of like what a relationship even looks like. Um, I've, I'm reading a lot about like ethical non-monogamy and, you know, different kinds of relationships that oftentimes have come from the queer community. and. There's just, there's so many ways to be in love. There's so many ways to be in sexual relationships. And I think just being able to think about all of those things and have them on the table, a lot of people aren't comfortable with some of them. That's totally fine. But just being able to think, you know, what, what does life look like for us? It doesn't just have to be two people meet, you get married, and then you never ever talk or look at anyone else again, and that's your life. Um, that works for some people, it doesn't work for other people. And so I think, um, yeah, that kind of creativity and 
really being able to be partners in that and supporting each other's kind of feelings and desires and identities instead of being afraid or jealous of them, I think is really important. Or has been for me. Um, so how do you really feel that your sort of bisexual identity is received um, either by the gay community or by the straight community or? That's a very good question. Um, I think, I, I think that it can be really difficult to be, to have a bisexual identity at times. I know there are different challenges with, you know, a lot of different groups, especially within the queer community. Um, but I think it can be, bisexuality can often fall in this place where, you know, pe people don't like uncertainty and people don't like things that are kind of outside of a box. And so sometimes I do feel like it would be a lot easier to just be one or the other. Um, and I think I have, you know, as I've mentioned, it's kind of difficult to be perceived as a certain way and know that it's not the way that I feel. So, you know, walking around with my male partner and being like, okay, everyone here thinks I'm straight. And again, in certain circumstances, that's really protective and I can feel safe walking around and we can live wherever we want, we want to live. And there's so much privilege afforded in that. Um, but then there are times that I feel like I'm lying to everyone or that I'm not being my true self. Um, and that can be really hard. And then again, this need to like, do I just come out to everyone that I need or see on the street and occasionally, it's been hard to find that balance for me. Sometimes I think I, especially when I'm in queer spaces, feel really uncomfortable, like in a straight passing relationship and will try to like disclose my sexuality inappropriately. And I think as I've gotten more comfort, comfortable in myself, I have kind of settled into like, this is who I am. If people don't see that, that's okay. If people ask, I'm gonna tell them the truth if it's safe. Um, and then I think within the queer community, there are a lot of narratives that are really helpful and supportive to some people, but can feel kind of disparaging to others. Like I remember when I was kind of trying to come to terms with the whole gay thing. I was trying to watch a lot of queer content and movies and TikToks, which was really, really helpful for my kind of idea of what different identities were out there and what was possible for me. So overall, it was a really good thing. But there was this narrative that I saw come up all the time in the lesbian community, which is, you know, back when I was dating men or like back when I was bisexual and I was so stupid, like I was trying to convince myself that I wasn't a lesbian, that I wasn't gay. And like, ah, oh, I was just, you know, I was just lying to myself. I was so stupid back then. And you know, that's very true for a lot of people. I'm not at all trying to take that, you know, take that story away. But I think it really made me freak out a lot of like, am I in the point where I'm lying to myself? Like, how do I know that this isn't that, that I'm gonna look back in 20 years and be like, oh, you idiot, of course you were gay all along. Um, and it's really hard to feel like that and kind of not trust your own intuitions and feelings. And obviously everything's very fluid. So some days you feel, I feel more queer and some days I, I, you know, I just don't know what to do with that. And so that was really tough for me. And I think when I was first looking a couple of years ago, I didn't feel like there was as much like bisexual content. Um, so I was just kind of looking at all the lesbian TikToks and YouTube videos, which again was really helpful. But I do think that in, you know, in recent years, especially maybe since the pandemic in 2020, it's, there's been more of that. I mean, the vast majority of the queer community is bi or pansexual, is multisexual. So the fact that there are these kind of, you know, bi phobia or, all, or these kind of like bi erasure it's quite silly because there's a lot of us. And so I think recently people are starting to create more of that content and speak up a little bit louder for the bisexual community. And so I feel a lot more represented in that way. Um, do you want to say anything else about the role of media sort of in this journey? Or yeah, yeah, really sure. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, it's so, so important and I think represents something so different about my journey than a lot of queer elders who didn't have a lot of media shaping their their queer journeys. Um, 
representation is so important to me. I think maybe it has an outsized impact, whereas I feel like if I, I just don't feel comfortable doing things if I don't really see people doing them. Um, and so, yeah, when I was first kind of wrestling with all these things, I really, I, I talked to like a, she was like a teacher or like a graduate student assistant in one of my courses who I knew was bisexual. And I was like, hey, can I ask you a personal question? Like, I think I might be on this journey. I really need some advice. And she gave me a couple of like Instagram and TikTok pages. I can't remember exactly what they're called of just like different queer, um, just pages with content. And it's so validating. I mean, it doesn't even matter what they're saying, really. It's just like people talking about it and, you know, living their normal lives is, is so, is so excellent. I watched a ton of queer movies. Um, one of my really good friends came out about a year after I did and, um, she's pansexual. And so we were like, all right, well, let's do the queer education, you know, just going through all of the, um, especially like queer female pieces, um, Portrait of a Lady on Fire is the best movie ever. It changed my whole life. Um, and so like trying to catch up and watch all these movies and watch all this content. And it's awesome. Um, it was so valuable for me. And it's also great to share with other people in my life. Like, you know, for Pride Month and my fiance is like, oh, let's watch some gay things. And I'm like, great, I can teach you about some of the things I've learned about this community. Um, but as I mentioned, there's, there's not a lot of, I mean, maybe until recently, not a lot of bisexual, like specifically bisexual content. Like if you Google, um, you know, bisexual movies, it will maybe say like Brokeback Mountain or movies that are like classically gay movies that where one of the characters had a history in a heterosexual relationship. It's like, well, we can't say that they're not bisexual because we don't know that in Brokeback Mountain, he wasn't also attracted to his wife but it just wasn't a good marriage and now he's gay like there's no way to know and so but that definitely I wouldn't say that's a inherently bisexual story um and so it's a lot of like people kind of making things up and like oh we think these characters are bisexual and kind of you know fan shipping different things um but recently there have been a couple of great a couple of great ones the British show Heartstopper has a bisexual character. Um, I'm trying to think of other ones. There are a couple of really good ones now. And that um, <laughs> that always, you know, fills me up and I'm really happy to see that. And I think in a way, this is kind of strange, but sometimes when I get in these like kind of bisexual spirals, as I call them of like, you know, Will I ever be satisfied? Will I always be missing something? You know, I it would be easier to be one or the other and it's all, all this uncertainty is really painful. Um, something that has always been really affirming and empowering for me is movies where I'm attracted to both leads. Um, there is the first time this happened, my friends and I went to a drive-in movie theater and saw Dirty Dancing and I was like, just so enthralled with both of them. And, you know, he's like so muscular and strong and she's so beautiful and her hair and her little waist. And so being like, I just kind of came away from that, like how beautiful and lovely that I have this, you know, I can find beauty and, you know, sexiness and joy in everyone and in so many different people. and. I feel the same way watching Pirates of the Caribbean or High School Musical, just like, ugh, I just love, it's fun. And you know, it's an even more, um, it's an even more amazing thing to watch when you're attracted to both Kira Knightley and Orlando Bloom. <laughs> um, so do you, uh, do you feel accepted in queer spaces? I mean, have you experienced any uh, discrimination? Or yeah, anything? that's a great question. I think, I mean, a blanket statement, I've never experienced any direct or kind of outsized discrimination. Again, I'm a, I'm a white, straight passing person. And so I'm really lucky and very privileged in a lot of those ways. Um, I definitely haven't always felt included or welcomed in queer spaces. 
Um, at my university, there was a queer resource center um, that, you know, there was no outspoken rules, but it, I guess just a sense that, you know, a lot of very alternative queer people found a home there, which is excellent because those are people that often need a home and I'm really glad they have that space. Uh, but I definitely wouldn't have felt comfortable um, going in there. I think maybe it was a, you know, maybe it was just discomfort that wasn't justified. Maybe I would have been welcomed there, but I don't think, um, I just didn't feel that way. Um, and I do, I think a lot of it is kind of self-imposed. Um, whenever I enter queer spaces for the first time, I feel like everyone's like, she's not gay, get her out of here. Like, um, especially if my partner is around, um, you know, or like I find myself sometimes, you know, I'll be like, oh, my partner, like trying to avoid any pronouns so that they don't know he's a boy. <laughs> um, so I do feel like, again, I don't know, maybe some people would be like, oh, don't be silly, we love bisexuals here. But I'm, I do feel sometimes that there are people who would feel like I'm less queer or that I don't belong in queer spaces. Um, that being said, when I, when I have really um, put myself in those spaces, which has really been here in Savannah. Um, when I moved here, I wanted to get involved in the queer community and I was spending a lot of time in the Starland district, it's my favorite area. And I, uh, I just walked into the First City Pride Center and decided to volunteer there. And every Thursday I opened the center and put out all the flags and filled the water bowl for the dogs. Um, and just interact with people in the community. And, you know, I helped out at the Stonewall Pride events recently. And now I'm actually the, the librarian, the queer librarian in charge of organizing our library, which I love doing. Um, and everyone has been really wonderful and supportive. Um, and I felt really, really accepted. So that's really great. Um. Well, we'll come back to that. One last question. Are you out in your partner's military spaces? Great question. Um, that is, it depends. Um, that has been probably the hardest frontier. Um, there have been a lot of his close friends are really lovely and I'm out to them and they know who I am and are, you know, um, are lovely and supportive. Um, I don't know if they're specifically supportive of the identity, but they are nice to me and I don't really know what they think behind closed doors. Um, I know that some of his friends and colleagues are quite conservative um, and quite religious. And I know that some of them oppose gay marriage. Um, again, no, no one has been cruel to me personally. Um, so it's just kind of navigating those spaces where everyone is nice and, you know, smiles and will chit chat with me, but I just don't really know kind of how they really feel, or I guess I do know how they really feel. And it's kind of hard to incorporate. Um, and I do find myself you know, it's kind of a constant battle. Do I just say, this is who I am, everyone get used to it. Um, you know, I'm also Jewish, so I think that kind of, you know, throws that in there. I feel really different than a lot of the people in that community. Um, so sometimes I just say, this is who I am, this is what I'm doing. Um, and some people, sometimes I don't feel that comfortable and will just kind of like recede into the background a little bit and kind of hide. Um, in terms of like whether or not I'm actually out, I would say he doesn't share it unless he gets very close to people. Um, but he's not really actively avoiding it. Again, no one really asks, hey, is your fiance gay? <laughs> so um, if, you know, if he feels close with someone, a colleague or a friend, and they ask about me, he might share. And I feel really happy when that happens because again, I just like to be known and I like to be known for my full self. Um, but yeah, it depends. <laughs> Um, anything else about that part of your life? And then we'll pivot to Savannah. Let's see. I think that's it for now. I'll let you know if anything else comes up.
Right, so you said you've been volunteering at the Pride Center. Yes. Um, you just walked in. You want yep. to talk about your journey there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I walked in. Um, the first time I ever was in Savannah was I was looking for houses for me and my fiance to live in. And my, my mom was here looking at real estate with me. And we, I don't know how we found the Starland District. We were just... I think we were, oh, we were going to Henny Penny um, on Bull Street. And I, from sitting with her at lunch, I looked over and I saw the flags outside of the Pride Center. I was like, oh, mental note, I'm gonna come check that out when I get here. So when I moved in, I went and was hanging out in that area, walking around and I just walked in. And I was like, hey, what do you all do here? <laughs> and they told me about everything, said, you know, if I was interested in volunteering, I could. and. I had an interview with the director and I was all nervous and I was really excited to, you know, be a part of this community. For me, it was perfect because I work remotely right now. So I was like, I would love to have some stuff to do in the community. I would love to meet people. I would love to support people. And I've done a lot of work, like organizing work in the community, mostly kind of through academia and um in college i worked at a sexual health peer center so i am you know i've done counseling and sexual health for a while and through that interact with the community a lot but i've never been a part of just like a you know queer support resources organization and I especially never done that in the south so i was a little bit nervous i was like are we safe here <laughs> um but it's been absolutely wonderful i i love working there i love meeting people and you know just connecting with the community and having some a little purpose yeah i love organizing the library it makes me so happy i love the label maker <laughs> i get to make everything perfect um yeah do you what do you think are their strong suits i think there's a really i know i think um, they might be moving physical locations uh, soon, but at least currently there's such a calming presence there. And I think the fact that they have cultivated this space where people can come in and maybe they have specific questions and are looking for something or they can just come and sit and, you know, take some stickers or take some resources. Um, that's, I think, very rare oftentimes in the world. Um, I also think that I think that there's the center is has so many ideas and projects and different ways to reach out to different communities and there's so many passionate people that I've met who are so different from one another people that I never would have met otherwise who are just, you know, fighting the fight in different ways. Someone makes these beautiful homemade bracelets that any volunteer can pick up when they come in. Um, you know, everyone's kind of using their different strengths in different ways, making partnerships, all of the money, all of the finances. So I think that's really great. Nice. How big is their library? Great question. <laughs> um, the library is pretty big. It's like, one full wall of a pretty big uh, room in the back of the center. Again, I don't know what it will look like when they move. Um, so we have a collection of DVDs, which I don't know if people are still using those. Those might be archival soon. <laughs> um, I have some DVDs. We have a lot of nonfiction and fiction books. Um, and then some magazines, children's books. And no, I think that's it. <laughs> but it's, it's great it's a collection it's just that people have donated over the years um, not everything is queer um, I think it's a really fun mix there's there are a lot of memoirs from queer celebrities there are like queer books of poetry um, like Savannah classics um, a lot of books about kind of nonfiction books about how to uh, learn and teach our children and fam queer families and talking about that um, which is awesome and then there's one thing that I think is really cool um, do you know the Bechtel test um, that people say about movies the idea is that um, 
a, a movie passes the Bechtel test if there's a scene with two women talking about something other than a man. Um, and surprisingly, not very many movies pass this test. Even today, if you look up like Oscar movies 2022 that pass the Bechtel test, it's usually like a handful. Um, but the person who came up with that was Alison Bechtel, who is a queer cartoonist and writer. Um, and we have all of the original cartoons. Um, it's a series called Dykes to Watch Out For. Um, and in one of them, she introduces the concept. It's like a little uh, comic panel, not cartoons, comics, I think is more apt. Um, a comic panel where she um, creates this theory, which I think is really cool because not a lot of people know that it came from that. Mm. Are you involved with any other organizations in town? Yeah, I actually, I work at um, Starlin Strange, which is an ice cream store slash clothing store. Um, not really an organization, but that's just, that's another part-time hustle that I'm doing at the moment, which is really fun. And there's an ice core community there as well. Very nice. Um, how would you describe Savannah's current relationship with the LGBTQ community? Yeah, I know my perspective is pretty limited on this because I've only been here for six months, so I definitely can't speak to more of the, you know, the longer history um, with the queer community. But I think for me, so I grew up in DC, I've lived in California, I've lived in New York. Um, I was very nervous to come to move to Georgia. Um, I was feeling like, I thought that it would feel very Southern here in a way that it would feel kind of restricted and very traditional and old fashioned that there wouldn't really be a thriving queer community. Um, and that has not felt true to me at all in Savannah. And part of it I know is kind of a sampling error because I mostly hang out in the Starland district and a lot of my friends here are queer and I hang out with a lot of SCAD students and spend time at the center. So I know that's not true everywhere in Savannah. But I think, I mean, especially with, you know, with having SCAD here, there are so many young, artsy, queer people here. It, it feels more like Williamsburg, I think, than it does like Georgia. So I've just been so surprised and so pleased with, with the community here. I mean, just a couple of weeks ago at the Stonewall event, I was helping, I was a bar back and helping out at the bar and there was, the event was like four or five hours there was never a time where there wasn't a line like there was a line for four full hours of people to get wristbands and get drinks at the bar and i had no idea how many people there would be there were so many people there <laughs> so i think just that was a real surprise to me and you know there's just so much vibrant queer life here which is great and I know that that is in the context of we still are in Georgia and there's still policies and laws that, you know, that affect queer people here that don't affect queer people in places that aren't, um, you know, that have more progressive legislature. Um, so that is very real and very true. But I think just day to day, I've been so pleasantly surprised by the community here and all of the connections. So would you would say Savannah is an inclusive community at this time? To me, I feel like it is. Again, in this small space that I inhabit, it feels very inclusive. Um, you know, I think getting outside of the little bubble, I'm not so sure. Actually, so I live on Whitmarsh Island and I'm not so sure about the people in my neighborhood. It's a suburb, it's a beautiful suburb. Um, there is some political paraphernalia in the neighborhood that would suggest to me that they might be more conservative. Um, you never know, obviously. I actually, <laughs> I really laugh because there is one house in our neighborhood that has, there's a lot of um, blue line flags supporting the police. And there's one house in our neighborhood that has a flag that has the line supporting the police, a red line supporting the firefighters, I think, a green line supporting the army, I believe, another one supporting, I think, emergency services or something like that. And I'm like, well, that's a rainbow flag. <laughs> um, I don't think it means the same thing, but that is in fact a flag that is rainbow, so I'm gonna count it as a gay flag. <laughs> um, 
so that's kind of funny of course <laughs> I don't I can't you know I can hypothesize but I don't know for sure if anyone in my neighborhood is um is a fan of queer people or not um I think less likely than the people in the Starland district um I don't I wouldn't feel comfortable hanging a pride flag at my house um have you sort of witnessed across the spectrum trans people of color does it seem representative of all of these communities in my neighborhood in general or in general Savannah, Savannah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think definitely, you know, it's there are pockets here and there. I think I have interacted with a lot of trans and non-binary people at the center. Um, and I would say a decent amount other, like just out in Savannah. Um, I think that the Pride Center is struggling to be really inclusive of a lot of different racial groups. I think um, at the moment we don't support as many people who aren't white. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, a lot, we support a lot of different people, but I think it, our audience at the moment probably skews white. Um, and so I think there's a lot of people actively working on, on being more inclusive, um, you know, and creating more connections with people in different racial groups. Um, so I do think there can be a bit of that sec like kind of racial segregation um, in different areas, but I do feel like there's, I mean, there's so many different types of people in Savannah and it does feel like, I mean, maybe not all groups that are represented in the U.S., but it does feel like there are a lot of different, a lot of different communities here and hopefully the queer community is doing a good job of kind of stewarding those connections. Um, so other than the Pride Center, are there any other organizations or businesses or neighborhoods that you have witnessed that are particularly queer friendly? There is, I think I was really surprised to see um, churches that are outwardly queer friendly. I am not, I'm Jewish, but not particularly religious um, and have never, uh, I, had, I used to go to church actually with my dad a little bit when I was younger, but I'm not an avid church goer um, and my perception of church um, and Christianity and Catholicism in general is that they are often not um, inclusive of queer people and I know that's true for some people in some churches but I have seen I know at the Pride Center we have a kind of a um, like a bulletin with different supportive communities or businesses um, in Savannah, and there's so many churches, which really surprised me. And there's actually one church on the way to Whitmarsh Island that has a, all these rainbow colored doors in front of the old church building and says, all are welcome. And I just, that's really wonderful to me. And I'm just really glad that people here have that opportunity. Do you know the name of it? I don't. What's the intersection? It's right. It's on Victory, kind of before the bridge to Whitmarsh. It's, I, I think it's across from a barbecue place called like Erica Davis Slow Country, I think. Mm -hmm. I could find the name, but it's right around there. Oh, that's good, that's helpful. Um, are there any important leaders that you've met in Savannah's LGBTQ community? Yeah, I think that the director, the current director of the Pride Center is really inspiring to me. Um, I really, he, he leads the center with a, a real um, a grace and I think a, he's pretty soft-spoken. Um, I've interacted with a lot of leaders in my time that are very loud and um, I really, I really respect and appreciate a, a very kind of quiet, powerful, graceful leadership. Um, and I think he's doing a really great job at engaging volunteers. It's really hard to get volunteers to do, to do things, um, you know, when everyone's really busy and has a lot of things going on. So I was, cause I would usually kind of come in and do my 
front desk shift and kind of work on my own things and then chat with people when they came in and he was kind of like well we need someone to organize this library like what do you think and I was like mm, I'll think about it and then he showed me the label maker and then he showed and I was like okay I'll do it <laughs> then I spent a ton of time on that so I think he does a really good job at um at bringing people up and um and bringing people together in a really lovely way and that's Lawrence yeah that's Lawrence What's his last name? It starts with an A. I don't remember how it's spelled or how it's pronounced. Um, in your time here, have you witnessed any specific events or traditions? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, so I was at the Stonewall um, Pride event, which was just so cool. Um, it's been really cool to see kind of the local drag community um, in Savannah. I'm a big fan of drag. I, both local and national levels, I am actually in a RuPaul's Drag Race Fantasy League, <laughs> which is really fun. Uh, my fiance is really big into fantasy football, and I was always kind of like, annoying. And now I get it because it's very, very <laughs> stressful. <laughs> um, so I really enjoyed at the Stonewall event, there was like a drag competition, which I thought was really cool. Um, it's been really fun for me to interact with people at the center, um, just other volunteers. And then they're like, oh yeah, I have a drag show. I'm like, you do drag, that's so cool. <laughs> I've never met someone, you know, like interacted with someone out of drag in like a professional or volunteer context and then find out that they do drag. So that was really exciting for me. Um, <clears throat> I think I have been to Club One a couple of times, uh, the gay bar here, um, which is really cool. I, they have a bunch of events that I haven't checked out yet that I really should, but it's just, I mean, it's cool to know. I am a big fan of the Lady Chablis, of course, um, the Queen. So it's, I mean, it's, I didn't know initially that she was from Savannah, um, like I'd heard of her from the drag royalty world. And then moved to Savannah and read the book, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. I was like, that's so crazy. I didn't even know she's from here. Um, so that feels really cool to be kind of in this, you know, place of drag and queer history and, you know, the legends. Um, and then both, you know, to be in those spaces and then also see just new, new drag performers on the scene. And um, one of my co-workers at the Pride Center, co-volunteers, like just started doing drags. I was like, oh, that's so cool. It's like the life cycle of, of Savannah drag. So that was really awesome. Are there any drag performers we should know about? Mm, that's a really good question. I have to admit, I haven't fully become immersed yet in the local scene. Um, so I will have to think more about that and go to more <laughs> shows locally. Um, nationally, yes, there's a million. I think I'm currently really into Jimbo, the drag clown, just want to all star date, spoiler, sorry. Um, but I, yeah, I love, I, it's just cool, especially now to see Drag Race on such an international scale. So there's my, my best friend and I, we are watching all of it. So we now watch Drag Race Canada and Drag Race UK and Drag Race Down Under. And then there's the international seasons where they all compete against each other. It's awesome. So. Yeah, I guess Jimbo is one to check out right now. <laughs> um, do you know anywhere other than Club One that they do performances? Are there drag or general performances? Um, I know that there's Front Porch Improv sometimes does like drag improv. Um, there is a show there. Um, there might be another place downtown, but I'm not sure. Um, do you know of any pivotal, like, turning points or major events in Savannah's LGBTQ history at all? I'm not really sure. I think it seems to me like Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil is just a turning point in recent Savannah history in general, and I think its proximity to the queer community it was probably interesting. I read the book recently and can both see how it was very revolutionary at the time to include and kind of, 
you know, create this queer star um, and like celebrate this drag queen in a way that probably hadn't been done on, you know, a, on the national stage. Um, but also it's a little dated. And so um, I think that was, just, I'm sure that was a big part of the kind of at least more public part of the Savannah queer community. Um, can you speak to the AIDS crisis in Savannah at all? Not really, because I was not here and very young. But <laughs> um, do you have any insight on sexual health education in the community oh, happening now? That's a great question. Um, there is there are a couple groups so at the pride center there's free hiv testing which i think is awesome i think it's a university that sponsors that um i think that's fantastic um the center is also developing right now a training it's not really sexual health focused but just kind of like a queer literacy training um that i think we're planning on taking into the community um and kind of you know offering to people who are interested maybe like businesses and different things like that um so keep an eye out on that because i think that will be really really cool um we've talked about kind of looking into doing some kind of sex ed or sexual health curriculum um it can be tricky especially with um minors and just like thinking about who really needs this education but it can be harder kind of legally um, but I think maybe that will that will happen in the future some kind of sexual health sex ed um, training or something like that it's something that I'm really passionate about Thanks. Um, do you want to share more about that queer literacy program yeah I don't know that it's called it's called something um, it's a training that is being developed by the leadership at the Pride Center. Um, I just call it the queer literacy. I don't I think it's more of like a, um, kind of like a DEI training or something like that. Um, it's really great. We, I sat in on it, like I took the training and it's, I think it will be a really great way for... I think it will be an appropriate resource for people who maybe don't have as much experience with the queer community to learn some of the learn some of the words involved, learn how they can support people in their, you know, workplaces or their communities or family members who come out as queer if they don't really know how to how to talk to them or how to support them. I think that could be really great. Um, and one thing I also just remembered that I was going to say about the library in my queer librarian role is that we were thinking recently about, so we had some content was donated that it was sexually explicit in nature. Um, and we had, some people had different thoughts of like, should we take this all off the shelves and not have it in the library? Um, should we have some kind of system where you have to be kind of confirmed that you're over 18 to check it out? And kind of decided I'm a big, you know, sex positive person. I think that sexual content should be available for people who identify in all different kinds of ways and that sexual content can be really beautiful and really empowering and so we kind of wrote you know found a way to write up um, a couple of posters that say things like you know we have a variety of content here some of it might be sexually explicit if you need help looking for a certain kind of thing and you're hoping to avoid those materials, our volunteers can help you search. They can confirm that the, you know, search for the books that you have and make sure that they are appropriate for you. Um, but just be aware that it's out there. So essentially not censorship, you know, not censoring any material, um, but supporting people who are maybe minors or maybe looking to avoid sexual content, um, but also making sure that it is available for people who want it, which I think is cool. Um, so what future do you imagine for Savannah as it relates to the LGBTQ community? I think that I would love to definitely see, you know, to be a part of some more sexual health, uh, sex ed programming for sure. Um, as I mentioned, I think there is probably growth to be done in the area of connecting more authentically with people in different racial groups um, and making sure that the queer community that queer resources are serving queer people of all different kinds um, and in, uh, in many different groups. Um, and I think, you know, I really, I hope that we continue to 
to really bring a lot of joy. I think having, you know, events like the pool party and, and really, um, which there's, I, there's a queer pool party, which is coming up in about a month, I think, um, or maybe a few weeks. So just uh, times to come together and celebrate um, joy and queer joy, I think is really important. And I hope we continue to do that. Um, what would you say to any young queer people today? I think seeking out spaces, even if you don't feel like you fit into them, is really valuable and will teach you so much about yourself. Um, in my experience, people are very welcoming, even if you're not sure, or even if you would have some kind of doubts about if you're queer enough. Um, you are. Anyone who's queer and identifies as queer is queer enough. Um, and if you're still exploring, that's fine too. Um, and I think that we're lucky to be in Savannah in a place where not everyone is supportive, but there are a lot of supportive people and a lot of supportive groups and check out the Starlight District. <laughs> okay, anything else that you'd like to share about yourself or Savannah? I think that's it. Yeah. Do you have any other questions? No, that's it. Uh, is there anybody else we should talk to? Hmm. I just thought of a person that I can ask and see if he's yeah. interested. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, uh, well, thank you so much. Really thank appreciate you. It.